Take your seats, please. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the second day of Automotive Logistics Global. I hope you enjoyed the first day that you, you know, met some, some new people, made some new contacts, reinvigorated old or existing contacts, uh, enjoyed the sessions, enjoyed the presentations, uh, and enjoyed the, the networking in the ideas labs as well, where we, we split up into smaller groups. Um, it was great to see how much people interacted, uh, the questions we were getting, uh, and, and the opinions that were being shared by everyone. So thank you very much for a real wholehearted participation. I hope some of you made it to the dinner last night as well. Um, I've been very fortunate. Our team, Lauren, put on a great dinner last night. Uh, yeah. For those of you who weren't there, that applause was probably for my opera singing last night. Uh, no, it was an amazing, amazing evening, hosted by our premier sponsors, Ryder. Uh, and it was, it was just a fantastic night. For example, you know, we, as we entered in the beautiful Detroit Opera House, what an amazing venue. Um, and then going inside, and then we were greeted as we walked in by a fantastic opera singer. Uh, she was, you know, amazing. The voice was fantastic. We then heard a presentation uh, from an organisation called Truckers Against Trafficking. Uh, they've got a table here today, or you know, or search for them in, t in the uh, uh, on the internet. It's traffickers, tra truckers against trafficking. It was a really, it was you know, uh, a really emotional presentation uh, about what the automotive or what the logistics industry can do to help to try and eliminate and save people's lives uh, from people uh, who, are, who have been trafficked. Uh, you know human slavery in a way. Uh, so please, you know, look into that a little bit further because that, that organisation has been set up to see how the logistics industry can save lives. I think it was shared last night that 1,100 people have been saved by truckers ringing up, seeing something unusual at a, a truck stop or in the hotels that they stay at. It's 1,100 people's lives and 300 of those were children. Uh, so it really was an emotional presentation. And then, you know, as I said, the opera singer and then a fantastic dinner after that. So it really was a great evening. And then after that, we went to the Sergier hosted Afterglow party and again, looked out at the stunning view of, of the new Detroit. Uh, you know, as you know, we have our conferences around the world and to see, you know, one way I was looking at the, the Tiger Stadium and the old Detroit, you might say, uh, the historical Detroit with the Detroit Athletics Club and, and so on, a fantastic view that way. And the other way, when I looked up, I thought I was in Shanghai with the bright uh, skyline and so on and the lights. It, was, it really was fantastic. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, the Detroit Opera House uh, and the view from the, from the rooftop of the Detroit Opera House really represented uh, the illustrious history of Detroit the Opera House and the buildings that have been there for hundreds of years and fantastic, or lots of years, and the great architecture from the glory days of Detroit and the new Detroit that's developed, the fact that we re rebuilding the Opera House and Institute of Arts, the fact that these new, this new stunning Shanghai type skyline is developing uh, is hopefully an indication of the illustrious future uh, that, that, that holds for Detroit and the automotive industry. Just a couple of small notes, uh, you know, we've got, uh, during the breaks, uh, please visit our sponsor area, our sponsor stands. Firstly, the reason they sponsor is because they've got services, knowledge, uh, people who can help you in your, in your sector, in your industry. And if that's not enough to get you there, there's some great games there, prize draws, uh, that there's iPads being given away on the sealed air stand. They're actually given away. They've cut out the middleman and just gone straight for the cash, uh, the gift cards, the cash gift cards, $250, $100, $50 gift cards. So visit the sponsor stands. You know, drop your card in uh, in the bowl or whatever they've got there, uh, and you know, have some fun, win some prizes, uh, and so on. But as I talked, you know, just now about the new Detroit. Um, it, 
it's fantastic to see what's developing here and it looks like, uh, and I'm pleased to see that as everything's changing, new mobility, new engine vehicles, autonomous cars, I'm hearing, we, we kind of, the focus has maybe been on the West Coast, but I'm hearing more and more about a lot of that is being, is either being brought back to Detroit or being led by Detroit. Someone said yesterday, I think we've got more autonomous test driving facilities in Detroit than anywhere else. So the future of the automotive logistics industry is definitely, or, or the Detroit has still got a huge, huge role to play in the future of the, auto, of the automotive industry. And we've, we talk a lot, have over the past years, uh, about the, the technology that's going to drive this. Artificial intelligence, 3D printing, autonomous trucks, autonomous vehicles, you know, big data and so on. Uh, but the theme of this conference is the human factor. And I must admit, when I was thinking of the human factor, I was kind of thinking about maybe the high level, maybe looking at, you know, how do we get the supply chain executives of the future? But as I looked into it a little bit further, and as I was trying to put this, uh, this, conference, this session together, it was obvious, uh, and definitely led by uh, ideas from, from Wendy, that actually you know, one of the biggest crises we've got in the automotive industry isn't necessarily at the top level, but at another very important level. Uh, the people who, who do the, you know, the, the, the kind of the work on the ground, you might say, whether it's drivers or warehouse people or line, line side feeders, this is you know, a huge shortage. And it's pretty well a, sh a shortage globally, but we're here to discuss it in Detroit. And the other thing, of course, is, uh, as I said, automotive logistics is, automotive industry is growing in Detroit. People are coming back to Detroit uh, because of, and the reason they're coming back to Detroit is because of, of the labor force, because they, you know, they'll find people here who have lived, worked in the automotive industry, sometimes for generations. Uh, but that just means as more companies, the great news is more companies are coming here to Detroit uh, to, to build plants or to build warehouses or, or whatever, but that just makes this particular issue even tougher. Uh, so that's what we're looking at today, the human factor in driving a strong workforce pipeline uh, and how we make the automotive logistics industry an attractive industry. Uh, been very lucky that Fiat Chrysler have supported us in putting a great panel together that involves Fiat Chrysler themselves, uh, you know, there's the kind of car maker representative, uh, we've got Mish Auto, uh, part of the Detroit Regional Chamber, to find out what uh, Michigan uh, are doing for, uh, to support the automotive industry from a human resources perspective. Syncreon representing the LSP, who have obviously got a huge uh, role to play in developing the, these, uh, these people and this, these kind of staff. Uh, and Maycomb Community College, uh, which is, as I've said, we've kind of focused on the past in universities, but we've got to make sure we get the people coming through from all levels, and community colleges are a great way uh, to, to develop these, uh, these kind of people. So what I'm going to do first, to begin with, I'm going to ask each of the panel members just to give a brief description, or maybe introduce themselves, uh, maybe a, just a brief description of why they chose uh, to be on this particular panel, why this is a... Uh, an in, um, a subject that's of interest to them. So first, uh, Wendy Gentry, Stunko from Fiat Chrysler. Wendy. Good morning, my name is Wendy Gentry. I'm responsible for supply chain management for North America for Fiat Chrysler Automobiles. Um, my role extends into getting product into our dealer body, um, all the way back to our long range planning responsibilities and making sure that we've set up an efficient and effective supply chain to support the needs of the market. The reason that I'm here is, is my job has really changed um, in recent years. I've been in the supply chain space um, in, in different aspects almost my entire career, which has almost 29 years now. Um, I've been with FCA for 20 years. And it, for us, it's all, it's all about output and getting the product to our customers that, that they so demand. And my struggle, especially in the last year, has been about getting that, that output. And really the output from our suppliers, our logistics partners, our, our carriers, and getting it to our plants and keep our plants uh, running productively. And so what has, has evolved is traditionally if I had a supplier who was struggling with their output, 
it typically was about capital equipment and tooling. Um, maybe it wasn't running as efficiently as it could be. And we would send it a team of technical experts to help them figure out how to, how to get that running. And what I found particularly in the last year, but it's been a growing trend, is they would go in there and say, the equipment's running really quite well. Well, then what's the problem? Why aren't they getting the output? And the answer was because there's not people on the line to run the equipment. And so this demand for human capital has become really center to, to my existence, to my, my career here. And so we've partnered a lot with, with our HR colleagues, different economic development agencies, to help not just us, but, but our suppliers to find that workforce to be able to maximize their output, because it's a huge macroeconomic impact for our region. So um, I'm clearly very passionate about the topic, and that's um, why, with the support of some of my team, we brought some of these individuals here, because they have some of the answers that you might be looking for. Thank you, Wayne. Thanks. I'm Glenn Stevens. I'm executive director of Mich Auto, which is the automotive uh, association for the state of Michigan. We're housed at the Detroit Regional Chamber, and so I, I work for the chamber, and I also work statewide uh, around the state with universities, community colleges, OEMs, suppliers, uh, K through 12, whatever it takes uh, to, really, to really build our industry here in Michigan. And the number one thing, and the reason I'm here today, is there is not a more important factor than the human factor, period. Uh, FCA and Ralph, we were talking about Ralph this morning, and their designs come from people and their engineering prowess comes from people and they manufacture with people, but they can't continue to grow, nor can uh, companies like Synchron or others unless there is the talent to propel that growth. And when we look at Detroit and the region and Michigan, we know that economic growth comes and is driven by talent and is driven by people and having the right skills for the companies that want to grow here or the companies that want to come here. And I, I mentioned yesterday, I, I think many of you were here, there are now 17 OEMs with either global headquarters, North American headquarters, or some type of R&D or tech center here, and Subaru's just announced a, a growth here. So I can't think of a more important thing, and most of my work is focused on the talent pipeline. We advocate for the industry in Lansing uh, to some degree, federally also, particularly when there are trade issues like there are today. And we really work on the awareness and the image of the industry because we want, whether it's students or new Americans or veterans coming back into the workforce or reskilling people, we want people to look at your industry and the auto industry as high tech, global, and growth. High tech, global, and growth. Uh, because that's what these companies are. And we're competing against companies that project those same images. So growing your companies here and allowing new ones to come here is really going to uh, rely on the human factor. So thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jim Barnett. I'm the president of Syncreon Americas. Uh, in my capacity, I'm responsible for running all the warehouses that we have in uh, North and South America for automotive operations. Uh, this problem for me is probably one of our biggest problems that we have in the company. Uh, biggest opportunities, I should say, probably. Um, it manifests for us in terms of turnover and in terms of attracting people. And I was telling the group the other day that um, we have a, a huge employee turnover problem in, in our business. And I think it's common uh, for probably everybody in this room. Uh, we turn at a typical warehouse about 10% of our hourly workforce every month. Uh, some are better, uh, some are worse, uh, some are very curious. Uh, we have three warehouses in Memphis. One has a 1.5% turnover every month, and the other one has 20%. So it's an interesting problem to approach. But we've studied this, and uh, we've uh, seen that it, it really, at a minimum, costs us about $2,000 for every person uh, that we turn over. Uh, in my region, I have about 4,500 hourly people and about 800 salary people. And we actually turn about 4,500 hourly people every year. Now, we have a, a great level of seniority in the hourly ranks, but what it, what it turns out is that about 80% of our turnover is in the first 90 days of employment. And we've really tried to tackle this problem by trying to figure out what do we do differently and what's happening in the marketplace that's driving this behavior. Um, quite frankly, I was hoping to learn something here today about that. Uh, <laughs> I, all I have is a 
is a long laundry list of problems, and it's actually something that it's not a Michigan problem, it's not a United States problem, uh, but it's a global issue. Uh, we talked about it, I was telling Louie and uh, Wendy, we have a board of directors meeting this week, and typically before that we meet as the executive board for the company. And we spent uh, an hour uh, yesterday just talking about turnover uh, around the world, about uh, attracting talent, recruiting talent, and uh, then retaining them. And it is a huge opportunity for us, a huge dollar value attached to it. And, um, I think there's some strategies that we'll talk about today that maybe will help, but uh, I'm actually all ears about what, what, what we can do to solve the problem. I'm Joe Petrosky. I'm the, the Dean of Engineering and Advanced Technology at uh, Macomb Community College. Um, Macomb Community College is, is Michigan's largest community college. Uh, it's located just uh, northeast uh, of here. I'm responsible for the, the programs in the career and technical education area that relate with automotive, uh, robotics, electronics, manufacturing, machining, welding, uh, all of those different types of areas. And I mentioned career and tech education. That's a term that, again, was rebranded within high schools and community colleges probably about 15 years ago or so. That was the old vocational education, rebranded about uh, 15 uh, years ago. A little bit about community colleges in general, because I'll talk about Macomb, but I'll talk about the larger community college, uh, as well as some of the, the high schools uh, that we work with. There's about 1,100 community colleges nationwide, um, and they enroll collectively uh, 7.1 million uh, students. It's about 43% of the undergraduate uh, uh, population in colleges and in, in universities. And that typically surprises people that tour. Community colleges are often a, a, a best kept uh, a, a secret. Um, about 67% of the students at community colleges are part-time students, uh, the remainder full-time students. So again, the dynamic is a little uh, flipped from what's typically you find at the, uh, the university uh, level. And I'm here because I'm your supplier. Uh, I'm a key part uh, of the supply chain for that to that talent. I've got two customers. Uh, one is, is you, the industry that are employing the graduates uh, coming out of community colleges and the educational system. And my other uh, customer, of course, is those students, the students that are enrolling in community colleges. More and more, again, their primary objective is seeking a good job. That's kind of uh, always been the case, or more so has been the case with, uh, with community colleges. I've got a ton of stakeholders, but uh, those are my two primary uh, customers. So it's a topic that, uh, that I'm very passionate about. I'm a strong believer in industry education partnerships. Uh, it's a key part of, of, of what we do at, at Macomb and all community colleges. If the graduates coming out don't have the right skill sets, if you're not, uh, not hiring them, then we're doing something wrong. Uh, and so some of the things I want to talk about uh, today are, are the opportunities that are there uh, for becoming um, a, a long-term relationship with your local uh, educational institution, be it the high school, be it the, the grade school, be it the community college, be it the, the university level. Is the internship opportunities there, the apprenticeship opportunities, it's something else that we're big in with, uh, uh, with apprenticeships. Uh, and, and spreading that, uh, that word to companies and to students. Uh, student debt is something that uh, is on everybody's mind if, uh, if you're a student and, and, and you're a family. Again, apprenticeships, sponsored uh, education, a key way that makes the companies very attractive to students going into those areas. So I'm thankful uh, to be here, areas I'm very passionate about. And again, I'm your supplier, so I'm looking for, uh, for feedback and those connections and how we can be working together uh, uh, to get you the right uh, product and to connect our students with great careers. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panel. Uh, before we start, maybe just a show of hands. Uh, for who of you in the audience is, is, is this an issue? Is this, you know, the human resources factor? Uh, and particular, as I'm saying, not necessarily the senior executives of supply chain, uh, but, you know, drivers, warehouse people and so on. For who is this a, a problem and an issue? Please raise your hands. Uh, and, and it is really a global problem, as I said. You know, we do conferences all over the world. In fact, you know, one of the ones coming up next uh, is, a, is one in Eastern Europe, and they're definitely facing the same problem. And I was hearing even stories of, you know, there was a shortage in Germany, so they were hiring people from Slovakia and to, to be the drivers and the, uh, and the factory staff at, in Germany. And now Slovakia is developing, and they're now getting uh, immigrants from other parts uh, into Slovakia to fill their problems. So it is a global issue. 
Uh, but one of the biggest factors, I think, is, <clears throat> is the truck drivers. This isn't just about the truck drivers, but it is one of the issues. So um, I've even heard stories that, you know, I think, what was it, 11 out of the top 20 of the Fortune 500 companies mention the driver issue as a big problem for them in their annual reports, in their reports to analysts. So that tells you uh, how big a problem it is. So, um, so I suppose it, maybe the, the question's a little bit even broader than that. Is this an automotive issue? Is it a Michigan issue, uh, th this kind of shortage of, of stuff? When you got, you've got plants all over North America, in fact, you know, uh, Mexico and so on. It's not a Michigan issue. And, and in your understanding, is it an automotive issue necessarily? Um, it's certainly not a Michigan issue. It's, mm. it's clearly an automotive issue, but it's, it's an issue well beyond that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the challenges that we have with trucking capacity uh, the, the trucking companies don't really care who they're driving for, mm -hmm. where, where the need is and, and where they can optimize their pricing mm -hmm. structure is where they're going to go. Mm -hmm. So it's certainly not limited to our sector. In fact, I think the challenge for the automotive sector <coughs> is we're competing with all these other sectors, and mm -hmm. I don't know um, that we have, as effectively as we could have um, so far, partnered as an industry and done some things on the image front to better compete. Mm -hmm. Because at all levels, we're competing with the Amazons of the world, um, be it for, for skilled resources, non-skilled resources. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to most, Amazon, um, it, it's got that hip factor that, that um, maybe we don't yet have in automotive. And I think that's why organizations like Mish Auto are really important mm -hmm. to us, because we have, uh, beyond the human issue, we have a marketing issue that we need to solve. And we can only do that as, as an entire sector, I think. Okay. And talking about Mish Auto, you know, you, you, you're the head of Mish Auto, but you also represent the Detroit Regional Council uh, Chamber. And one of the successes of Detroit is it's not just automotive that's coming here. Other industries are, are growing here as well. So again, you know, is it an automotive issue or is it something that there's real competition in every industry that's coming Well, to? it's real competition in every industry. And I read the, the report you sent over, the Corn Ferry Future of Work report, um, mm -hmm. and it, it picks apart the world. And the, there's only one country that really doesn't have an issue, and it's India. Mm -hmm. it, across the, the three, there, it, it categorizes workers by three levels. But mm -hmm. everyone else has, has an issue. If you look at Michigan and the region here, um, automotive is our biggest, but we have a huge agricultural industry here. We have a, a huge service industry. There's a growing fintech industry in downtown Detroit, and they all depend on talent for growth. The interesting dynamic we have here, and I, I, I focus here, um, mm -hmm. is that the number of high school graduates in Michigan is plummeting because people, demographics shifted, people stopped having babies like they used to have. Mm -hmm. So we go from 2008 to 2028 from 135,000 high school graduates to 2028, about 80,000 high school graduates. That's not the graduation rate, that's just the number of kids graduating from high school. And then you add in the factor of the aging workforce. Mm -hmm. So 32% of the Southeast Michigan Manufacturing uh, Community is 55 years or older. So, and we all know the statistics, 10,000 baby boomers a day mm -hmm. hit retirement age. So when you put these two things together, our issue is magnified. It's not unique globally, but it's certainly magnified, which is why um, a place like Macomb plays such a huge mm -hmm. role um, in being able to, to sustain this growth. The good news about that statistic about being, was it 35% being 55 or older? That puts me at the younger end of, your, of the base <laughs> over here. <laughs> yeah. So as a logistics company, how, how do these things? Uh... Well, I think, you know, as Glenn mentioned, that, that Corn Ferry article that we talked about, mm -hmm. it, uh, to me, it kind of lays out the, the facts about the situation that we find ourselves in. The article says that by 2030, there's going to be 85 million jobs unfilled globally, and that'll have an $8.5 trillion impact mm -hmm. on the global economy. Um, we are definitely in a situation where we have a supply problem. We're, we're in danger in the United States of becoming the next Japan where you have a uh, kind of recessionary economy all the time that 
because you don't have a growing population, you don't have a growing workforce, and you have uh, uh, problems at the macroeconomic level that I think <clears throat> everybody in this room needs to recognize and somehow uh, we should work on public policy to address that issue. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is there's an, I, I did some more research, there's an article in USA Today uh, quite recently that said that inflation adjusted income you know, for median household incomes haven't budged in the last 20 years. So we're in the midst of an economic recovery mm -hmm. and we're starting to see the fact that there's a lot of pent up demand for workers and that's raising worker salaries. So we're kind of caught between two uh, different rocks here. We have raising salaries, raising cost bases, and a shortage of workers at the same time. Um, that means we have to be at a very strategic level in our daily business much smarter about how we attract and manage and retain workers. Um, when I was growing up in the automotive industry, I was taught, you know, if somebody doesn't show up, give them a point, discipline them. You know, they don't come, uh, they come in late, give them another point. You know, if they can't you know, show up, fire them. You know, get somebody else. There's always somebody waiting at the door ready to come in and replace that person. Um, that is not the reality anymore. The reality is, is we have to think differently about uh, hours of operation and shift patterns and how uh, do people have friends at work? Do we have a social environment at work where they want to come to work? Um, do we have daycare at our larger facilities? Do we have uh, free lunches? Um, are we innovating around attracting and retaining people? Uh, does the plant manager know everybody's name? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and it, does the supervisor uh, know his people's name? You know, you would think that that is kind of a, you know, a common sense thing. But it, as you dig into this issue, you find that we're not really training our supervisors and our management how to um, how to, you know, manage people properly and lead people. And uh, at a very grassroots level, we have to solve that problem. And we have to, you know, we, we have to fight with everybody in this room to attract and retain talent and with the other industries to do that. Um, so it's, uh, it's definitely a different way of thinking about the business. Mm -hmm. I would definitely agree with, uh, with that. Uh, I think it's a global issue, but it varies by sector. And most certainly the automotive sector uh, um, has that to that challenge that's there. There's programs at the college that uh, kids uh, flock to, you know, without advertisement, because they've got a cool buzz around them, collaborative uh, 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 design, interactive web design, gaming design. I mean, those are the ones that there's a big lineup uh, uh, there, and, the, and there's, there's more, more students than there are jobs. Um, when you get into over with great paying jobs, again, very often the students don't know about that, so I think part of that challenge is that connection with lining up early on within the supply chain where these types of jobs are and the great careers that, uh, uh, that are there. Um, we have a, a center at Macomb called the Center for Advanced Automotive Technologies. It's been sponsored by the National Science Foundation through this unique uh, uh, piece of government funding uh, that was dedicated by Congress to increase the level of middle-skilled uh, individuals in the, in the country. And so the charter of the, of the CATS, as we call it, uh, is to increase the pool of, of technicians. And again, we've got to go down to the sixth grade to get that image of, of manufacturing and automotive and design and all those things. By the time you're in high school, it's too late. By the time you're in college, it's way too late. So we have a big uh, event every year called Auto Steam. And the only way we can do this is in partnership with our industry uh, partners, FCA, one of the, the key partners there along with the other OEMs, and they're bringing in all of their, uh, their designers and their engineers and their technicians, and it's a very interactive event, 15 minutes for each pod, as we call it, just to get the kids excited. And again, it goes down to, to sixth grade. And then we've got a big car show there, which is wonderful to see all the kids climbing in and out of the cars, and just that level of excitement. But if you don't grab their, their uh, attention and enthusiasm and imagination at sixth grade, you've lost them up the, uh, the line. So it really is that long-term supply chain uh, uh, that, that you have to look at and then plug in at every level to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, I'll just do a kind of a, a quick survey of the room. Because there's two issues here. We're looking for kind of logistics people, but we're also trying to make the automotive industry attractive. So to the audience, again, with raising your hands, 
Who wanted to work in the automotive industry as opposed to who just fell into it, either started working in another industry and ended up in, in, a, in automotive? Who actually wanted to work in the automotive industry? Raise your hands, please. Okay, well, that's interesting. We're people who work in automotive and we're trying to get people into our industry. And then the second question is, who wanted to work in logistics? Who, when they started you know, at a young age, who thought, I really want to work in logistics? Okay, so again in the minority, and again, we're in an automotive logistics conference. The, what, the one, the, <laughs> and the strange one yesterday was when someone told me they actually wanted to, they, when they were young, they wanted to be in automotive packaging. Now that one was a strange one. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but at least it was there. So again, it, it, and then maybe one more question, and whether I'll split it in two. Yeah, no, I'll split it in two again. Who would want their children to work in the automotive industry as opposed to another industry. So raise your hands if you want your children to work in automotive. Okay. And then the next question, of course, is if they are, if they are in automotive, or, or would you want them to work in the logistics industry? Would you want your children to work in the logistics industry? Yeah. Okay, so in, interesting, because... You guys are supposed to be our, uh, you know, our showcase. <laughs> so there, there's a start, you know, as well as encouraging others to join. Let's let's encourage people we know to join the industry as well. Um, so and of course, don't forget this isn't a lecture from us. Uh, so if anyone's got any questions or comments uh, on this issue, whether what they're doing, what they'd like to do, what skills are required, please uh, raise your hand, wait for the microphone, say your name and company name because uh, we, we definitely want to hear the views of others in the room. Uh, but maybe what, what kind of skills are we looking for, uh, you know, for, from this gener for the next generation of these types of workers? So Wendy first again. Um, I think that the skills that we're looking for are to some degree technical, but a lot of them are also leadership skills mm -hmm. and being able to work as teams, work with others, um, have a sense of curiosity, continuous learning. Um, a lot of the technical skills can, can be taught. Um, certainly we need people to have analytical and problem solving skills, but just as important are the communication skills mm -hmm. and, and recognizing the importance of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I look at some of the struggles that we have um, in the trucking industry, um, it's, it's knowing that, that they're not going to show up for work or communicating that they had a breakdown. <laughs> I mean, if I knew those things um, quite often, I would be, I would be better off. Mm -hmm. And so you can't deny the importance of the soft skills. Mm -hmm. And I think those can be more challenging to teach, more challenging to evaluate. And so we're tempted to, to be drawn to the technical skills and, and talk about those a lot. But but it's the, the human side as well that I think is just as important. I, I think you kind of hit on it when you talked about mm. the leaders knowing everyone's name. Does it mm. feel like a family? Do you have a sense of obligation to show up to work today because you know you'd let the team down if you didn't? Mm -hmm. Those are the things that really make a significant difference in what we see in high-performing suppliers or carriers compared to those that are struggling. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you make two great points there, and to answer your question, one is these skills are a lot more digital today than they ever have been. I mean, the economy is, is digitalizing at a rapid pace. Um, the economists say there was steam, there was electricity, and there's digitalization, and digitalization is transforming everything. The Brookings Institute has a report out that I just love because it took 545 job classifications, which is 90% of the economy, and it measured their digital score in 2002 and 2016, and actually looked up transportation and warehousing. It had a skill, a, a digital score of 15 in 2002, and it has a digital score of 45 today for that job classification. Mm -hmm. So the first answer is digitalization, but I, I think you are right. They've, people have to be, in, be able to communicate and work in teams. I was at Waymo a couple months ago in Mountain View, and I got a ride in the Chrysler Engineered Design Vehicle, um, FCA, I keep calling it Chrysler. But the two, <laughs> the two young people in the front seat who were the technicians who were administering the vehicle, and we went on an automated ride through Mountain View, 
I asked them where they were from and what their degrees were in. Both were liberal arts graduates, but they were working as technicians mm -hmm. for, for Google Waymo uh, because they had the aptitude. And they, they, were, they were really communicative, but they were working on some really high-tech stuff. And I think it's a perfect example of, of people that have both of those skill sets together, and those are the type of people we need to work in our industry. Mm -hmm. Jim, what sort of skills are you looking for? Yeah, well, I, I, think, um, I think obviously the technical skills are, are important, and, but I would break it up into skills and attitudes and behaviors, because um, whether it's an hourly person or a, or a, a beginning salary person, supervisor level person, uh, we, we want to find people that have the, you know, that they, they want to be at work, they want to problem solve, they want to fix things, they want to become engaged in the team. Um, they're not just there to put their time in and, and then leave. Um, ideally, we find, uh, you know, um, uh, um, starting uh, salary people, college graduates, people that, that want to move because we're not located in one spot, so they're, they're really interested in going and getting different experiences and going different places and living different places. Um, I think it's really important for us that they have behaviors that, uh, you know, they, they, they like to be at work, they uh, like to get engaged with people, um, they like to teamwork and problem solve. Um, it's all about, for us, for about engagement of the worker and are we, are we, um, are we managing people, leading people to get that engagement back out of them? Mm -hmm. And what are you doing at Macon my, my to? I think you, you hit that, that mix of skills, and I want to share a way that, to the, that again, you can be mm -hmm. a part of that, to that process in making sure that those skills are, are what you need for hiring. Every one of my programs has an industry advisory council. We are required by state law, by federal law, to have that. And that shapes the curriculum where these discussions are going on with, you know, do we have the right classes in there? Are they being delivered? Do you see that in the graduates uh, that you're hiring? And then we're constantly tweaking that as the technology changes, as the, uh, the industry changes. So it's, it's, it's a mechanism to be engaged in making sure that you're, you know, you're getting the right skill set. And, and typically, again, a graduate coming out of one of the programs, what I look for is probably, I can get probably 85% common. If I get a group of, of companies in the room, I can get them to agree on about 85%, 80 to 85% of the common, you know, what the graduate should have. And the rest of that, that 15, 20% is gonna differ company by company. So I, I, I'm never gonna get 100% for a whole room full of, uh, of people. But being part of that process helps uh, shape that. And then community colleges in particular can be very agile in responding to your needs. And, and an example of a very recent one, again, in partnership with, with FCA in a conversation that started this past January uh, with FCA and, and uh, with their team, with, with what's the, the top area you know, in, in Southeast Michigan for, for hiring right now? And it came out with production supervisors big shortage of production supervisors. We have troubles finding production supervisors. Well, let's work together and, and, and put a program together to address that. And so again, the conversation started in January. Three weeks ago, we launched a program, an associate degree program, a two-year program that we call the, the FCA Production Supervisor Program. Chrysler really, FCA really dictated that to what that uh, uh, curriculum looks like. Again, we had all those pieces there, organizational behavior, quality, uh, manufacturing, and, and we put that uh, together, and they had a couple iterations and said, yeah, that's it. And a key part of it is uh, both the attraction and, and, then, and then embedding those work experiences is the students go to the school Monday through Thursday. On Friday is the built-in internship for two years where they're job shadowing and working at an FCA facility with a production supervisor. So then at the end of the two years, they've got two years of that one day of experience uh, every week. They've got that, that familiarity with, uh, with FCA. Those students that FCA hires, they then reimburse one year of the two-year uh, tuition with it. Again, from January to, to three weeks ago, all that came together. So very quick, very agile, but started with a conversation with, uh, with an industry member and saying, you know, what are your needs? Can we reply, respond to that and, and, and put something together? The thing I love so much about that story is my very first job was working for one of our competitors at a, at a plant in uh, Indiana. And uh, my first day they threw me out there to be a production supervisor and I had none of that training. <laughs> I was 18 years old and uh, 
it was an interesting experience. It shows you how much the industry has changed, again, a, a very long time ago. But, uh, but quite different from what you've prepared them to do, and I can only imagine how much more effective our supervisors coming off that program are going to be from, from how effective I was back then. I think I just uh, survived. <laughs> and as we were recruiting those students, again, that was a partnership. And the big draw were the FCA officials that were there because they expect the dean to say good things about all the programs that they're going to go into. But here they, and they had the, the industry officials, the folks that would be hiring them, telling them what it was like, what the careers were like, what the salaries were like. So, I mean, that was, a, that was the biggest draw for the students in getting them in that room, getting them excited about signing up for this program. Yeah, and the salary thing is key. I, as, you, as you discussed, recruiting um, younger people into the industry and how at very young ages, I mean, we, we kind of pound kids nowadays to say, what do you want to be when you grow up? From, from pretty much the, the time they enter the world. And I was excited after our conversation the other day, I got an email from my children's school. And it was something that was sponsored by an automotive supplier and, and Oakland schools, um, inviting you to learn about technology and how great manufacturing was. And it, it specifically called out that in the manufacturing industry, um, pay is 17 to 20% above other sectors. And we don't talk about that enough. If we want to market people to that sector, that's a compelling reason to come <laughs> into manufacturing. But I would contend that most people don't, don't know that. And so um, my son had a soccer game that night. I asked some parents in the stands about it. Every one of them had read it. And about 75% of them were surprised about that statistic. And these are people who live in Oakland County, Michigan. So you can only imagine how surprised people would be in, in other regions of our country. We, uh, to, we did a survey. Mm -hmm. to, I, I, we all talked about what we think people think about our industry. Yeah. But <laughs> we said, why don't we put some real market research to it? Yeah. So in 2014, we interviewed 900 students, parent teachers, and counselors. And we just redid the survey last uh, fall. So uh, about three years later. And the gap, the perception gap that exists between what the reality is, what the industry has to offer, and what parents, teachers, and counselors. Now, 2014 was a long time ago, and there were some scars still around, and parking lots were not quite full uh, where they were filling up. But what we have now is an industry that's viewed more favorably, but still a huge perception gap between what the industry has to offer. Um, we all know we work in a very high-tech global growth industry. But we have to get to, and you're exactly right, we have to get to younger people, and we have to get to people in general about the opportunity. I, I'll say it, I know everybody knows it, we don't have a people shortage. That's not the issue. The issue is there's a skills uh, issue and a skills gap between what people have and what people need and what people might not know they need to have to have opportunity in this world. Mm -hmm. That's my speech. Yeah. Again, any, uh, any questions uh, from the audience? There's one right at the back there, please. If you can say your name and your company name, please. Good morning. Um, Greg Logos. I'm with Gestop North America. And um, I, I think it's a very interesting topic. Um, throughout our facilities in the US, we obviously have a, uh, a definite shortage of talent. Um, I guess my question more along the lines is, uh, we talk about leadership, we talk about that skill set, needing to develop that. Um, I'm a big believer that working on the floor, working with the teams helps build that, but it doesn't come immediately. Do you feel as though we have an issue with the generation now wanting instant gratification and wanting that corporate job in the corner office and not getting the core skill set, maybe working in a little rougher environment on a plant floor where it's maybe not as Pretty, let's say. Um, uh, what, what, what do we do to, to kind of change that mentality where you need to get that core understanding of what we actually do at the plant and making that more attractive for the younger generation? Thank you. So Greg, there's a, a chicken and an egg there on, on a couple of things that I found with um, millennials, we'll say. Um, one of the things is all of them want to come out and go into some type of rotation program. And it's really interesting when I dig deeper, and, and this isn't research-based, this is just my experience. But when I dig deeper with them, they, they say things like, 
well, I have to figure out what job it is I want. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's not one job. I mean, I rotate jobs, I've rotated jobs my entire career every few years, and most of them I didn't even know existed when I started. So your career can be a rotation program. I remember someone from Procter & Gamble telling me, um, yeah, we have a rotation program. It lasts about 30 years. It's, it's, uh, each, each, each job you have for three years. The first year you learn, the next year you do the job, and the next year you actually take it to the next level. And, and so there's a little bit of this chicken and egg in what we, we tell these, these younger people to expect. Along those same lines, um, I, I believe in the depths of my soul that the best thing I ever did in my career was to start in manufacturing because I work for a company that makes something. And you need to understand how things are made when you work for a company that makes something. <laughs> and, and it also taught me amazing leadership skills that I don't know I would have learned any other way. And the, the example I always give young people is when you work in manufacturing, you recognize that lack of a decision is a decision. If you're trying to figure out if that part can go on that vehicle while you're standing there contemplating and you don't have all the data in the world, the vehicles are still moving down the line. Yeah. Or you stop the line. It's a choice. Both have consequences and you have incomplete information. And, and I find that to, for our company to, to perform at a very fast pace, people have to understand that key principle. And, and you learn it better than anywhere else in manufacturing. And so as I tell this, the, those types of stories to young people and how key that is in their career, I then meet with young people in my group and they say to me, I think my next job should be in manufacturing, Wendy. And I'm like, wow, what a great idea. <laughs> and, and so a lot of it is how leaders in our company convey this. And I've also conveyed to them that those of you that, that are intimidated by that, um, one, I need to educate you on why you shouldn't be intimidated. But if you can't get past that, understand that, that in my organization, you're going to be limited by it. You just are. Um, but when I take them out and I see that it's not as, as scary as some perceive, and how on that shop floor, you can find some of the greatest empowerment in the world, that tends to attract them more. So part of it is, is this perception thing, but as leadership teams, I think it's also conveying how that's a very important part of their career. And I'm finding people coming in line with that thinking, especially when I, I am very clear with them of it's not a forever decision. I'm not saying you need to now go work in manufacturing for 30 years. You can, there's great opportunities there, but it may only be for a few years. And, and there is a path back to the, the corporate world. And with that security, they're far more willing to, to make that leap. I, I think you're spot on. And I think there's something to be said for rotating people and giving them different exposure. I remember when I started, I'm just sitting here thinking, I'm, I, I was on a rotational program. I, I was an econ major. And I never thought I would be in manufacturing. <laughs> but I was on the blast furnace at Zug Island a week after I graduated. That's where I was. I, didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but I was in manufacturing, and that's what they wanted me to do. And I spent time in operations early on in my career. And I'll tell you, that building block today, I understand how things are made. And at the end of the day, you know, factory 4.0 and autonomous vehicles, listen, that's all really important. But physical goods still have to be made and delivered because that's what people buy. Mm. And that's what people touch. And, um, I think it's really important um, that we remember that. But, and I, I think that's why Manufacturing Day and the stuff that you do at Macomb is so important because it's meaningful. And that's in our DNA here. Mm -hmm. It really is in our DNA and our culture here. But we have to leverage that for the way the world's transforming too. Yeah, I think uh, the rotational program that you mentioned is an interesting one. We, uh, when, we, when I first came to St. Grant about three years ago, we didn't really have an internship program or a college grad recruiting program, and we started one off. And this year we had about 10 interns, and uh, we tried to hire 15 uh, college grads, and we only got six. <laughs> we actually put out about 20 offers, and a lot of them were turned down. Um, and I think there's a bit of a perception issue out there, because um, uh, 
I, you know, the people that we approached, first of all, we'd go to a, a job fair and there'd be lines for FCA, there'd be lines for Google and you know, mm -hmm. Amazon and there'd be like, two people that we'd have to entice over <laughs> with something, you know, some sort of <laughs> gift to get them to talk to us. Um, <laughs> But we did get uh, six really good uh, college grads that are mobile, want to live in different places. I actually asked one person, well, how'd your relocation go? And I've asked other, you know, more mm -hmm. senior people that, and they'll complain about the movers didn't show up, this didn't happen, that didn't happen. This kid just said, oh, I got the U-Haul, and my dad helped me drop the stuff on the apartment. I, was, I dropped it off on Sunday, I was at work on Monday morning, and I was like, oh, I love this kid. <laughs> <laughs> just great. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we now are taking those interns uh, and the college graduates and having them go to the uh, job fairs and the college recruiting events because they're our best advocates. And uh, we are um, not giving them uh, special assignments on the floor, but challenging assignments that need to be done. And I, I think they're really surprised by the impact that they can have and uh, the things that they're doing, because I think they tend to think about automotive as an old, um, like a Zug Island type of industry, pouring steel out of cauldrons, and while that still happens, there's a lot of high-tech work that goes sure on, a lot of things that are really interesting and compelling. But they just don't realize that. They tend to have this mindset that it's just an old industry, stagnant, not dynamic, uh, not interesting. And so uh, we need to work on that perception. We're trying to think about how do we change that perception as we go to these, as we go to these uh, job fairs and try to recruit more people. Uh, but uh, no, I mean, it, there's, there's a big impact that they can make and we just gotta let them know that somehow. And that, that's the whole intent of these internship programs. Mm -hmm in these uh, rotational assignment programs. We, just, we have a program called Discover Auto where we go into the schools and in the companies uh, and take kids in there. And we just did one at Washtenaw Community College. And I don't talk to the students there. We bring young graduates from those schools who are working in the, I mean, really mm -hmm. fresh, um, you know, three or four years. And we have them talk, this is what I do during the day. Well, I was just in Washington lobbying or I just got back from our test facility in Sweden. I mean, that's, when you have those young people talk to the people in the schools, the perception's very different, mm -hmm. and that's intentional, because if we don't change that perception gap, we won't be able to fill the pipeline. Mm -hmm. To your question with really invite them in is a key part of doing that, talking about the perceptions and changing those perceptions. Uh, Glenn mentioned Manufacturing Day that's coming up uh, October 5th. Macomb County and the, and the schools do a big event. There's 2,000 high school students that get out into uh, different facilities to see what's, uh, what's going on there. Uh, and that continues to, to grow over the, uh, the years. Um, I found that the students really don't have a perception about what's going on in there. It's kind of a clean slate. The parents, they have perceptions that you need to, uh, to change. The <laughs> students are open to, to all of this. And I was touring through with one of the companies uh, um, two years ago at, with Manufacturing Day, and it was a, a molding company in, 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 uh, international in scope and scale, and a lot of automotive that the work that they do and, uh, with, with headlamps and IPs and, and tail lamps. And, and they were talking about how this is constantly changing and the design through it, and again, a very impressive operation. And as we're walking from building to building, I was uh, going with, uh, there was a young uh, lady who was one of the high school students, and, I, and I, we we're about three quarters of the way through the tour, and I kind of struck up a conversation. She said, so did, did any of this uh, change any thoughts about your careers? And, and she said, well, I've always kind of thought that uh, I want to go into interior design, so I, I really, you know, this doesn't apply to me. And I asked her the question, I said, did you ever think about design in the automotive sense and, and the things that, uh, you know, the, the interiors there, the exteriors, what they're talking about, these products? And she stopped, she literally stopped while we were wa walking, and she looked at me and she said, I never thought about that. You're absolutely right. And, and, mm -hmm. and because it was just, it took that connection from what they were saying on the tour for her to make the leap that I really mm -hmm. like design. And wow, there's a whole bunch of design in the automotive industry. So just inviting them in, uh, and again, a manufacturing day or your local school, and, and to have that conversation uh, uh, with the, uh, the students can help change those perceptions. Hey, thank you. Uh, were there any more questions? Yeah, okay. I'm just yeah, going to stand up there. here because I can't see the, the thing properly, so I'm going to stand here. But we've got a question over there, I believe. Jeff Loster from ZF. Um, I think part of the, the issues might be the stigma from 2008, where 
there was a lot of people here in Metro Detroit that were you know, laid off, a lot of good people. No fault of our own, it's just the economy. And as we all know, uh, with anybody with any experience in this industry, it's cyclical, right? Yeah. And right now we're in a 10-year cycle and we know it's, we know it's coming again. Um, so I think that companies need to rethink when there's cycles in the business, how do they react to the cycles and how does that affect people? Thank nah, you. You're, you're right on. That's what, when we did our survey, that's what it showed. Is, and that's what I was referring to earlier when I talked about those scars. Uh, because those were deep. I mean, everybody knows that what it looked like here in 2008 9, and they're still in the back of my mind. You know, if I'm working in the industry or I'm telling you somebody to go, this thing will cycle, and it will cycle. Um, fortunately, when you look at the production numbers for North America, they're pretty robust uh, when you look out into the future. It depends on platforms and OEMs, but I think you're right. Companies have to plan for that. You have to develop a pipeline that's continuous and you have to work on it. You really have to work on it. It just doesn't come and go. But you're, you're right on with, with the stigma issue. Um, fortunately, now parking lots are full and vehicles are rolling and unemployment's very low, but we have to prepare for when things do cycle. And we're not the only sector that has nope. cyclicality. So I think it's also a matter of looking at how some of those other industries handle it as well. I mean, look point. at the energy sector. Um, but, but what's amazing to me is as I meet people at, at logistics conferences and supply chain conferences, how much they desire to have people with that automotive experience. And so part of our, our marketing as well is even, even if there are cycles and even if there is risk, what an amazing skill set that you have, even if you don't choose to spend your entire career in the automotive sector, it's an amazing place to start and it makes you incredibly attractive to, to other industries. Okay. There's another question. Hi, Sharon Gray with Tep Automotive. Um, I really enjoyed this discussion this morning, and I know we you know, are really focused on the skilled um, opportunities for candidates, but I'm curious, I, I think, Jim, you mentioned something, some initiatives that you were doing um, maybe for more of the unskilled labor uh, roles, because. Um, there's a lot of those roles within our industry, and I know, especially in Mexico, there's a lot of competition uh, for those roles, and I'd just be curious to hear if there's any other initiatives that your organizations are doing to attract even the unskilled labor roles where it's very competitive. Yeah, well, the, I mean, the unskilled labor, honestly, is, is probably our, our biggest opportunity. Uh, we're looking across the kind of the spectrum of human resource and leadership uh, activities that take place to get an employee retained and on board. Uh, we we want to look at the way that we recruit and the way that we market ourselves and um, then we want to look at the way that we expose the candidate to what the work is. Um, and then we want to look at the way that we onboard people and what happens in the first hour and the first day and the first week of their onboarding. Um, you know, basic things like, do you know your supervisor's name? Uh, do you know his phone number in case you're late to work? If you have a flat tire, do you know who to call? Things like that, basic things like that. A lot of people are like, I, I have no idea. You know, and so they, you know, we, we have a lot of turnover issues just because we're not uh, going after the recruiting mechanism properly. We're not onboarding people properly properly, and uh, we don't give them a good experience on the first hour and the first day and the first week. And we don't go back and check on them and see how they're doing and ask them what's going on. We don't have uh, you know, uh, an hour every day or we don't have something planned at lunch where we you know, bring in a pizza and everybody talks about what happened that day. There's just so many things that you should do right to really bring somebody in. And, our mentality is, is not great in this regard. We have a kind of a culture uh, that goes back 20 years about, uh, we're well, gonna put a sign out and we're gonna bring people in and we'll point to where they work and, and they're just gonna figure it out. And uh, we have to get around that because that's not the way uh, we're gonna, uh, we're, that's not the way to compete in a, in a very, very tight labor market. I mean, we got to figure around this mentality that oh, for short workers, we're just going to call another temp agency. 
You know, that, that's, that's kind of like the strategy I hear a lot. Okay, we'll just, well, we're going to get purchasing, call our techie, uh, temp agency, and we'll just get more people to come in. Um, we are really rethinking all of that. You know, how do we recruit? How do we go right to the market? How do we go to a perm hire model instead of a temp hire model? Where is the temp hire model really necessary to cover volume fluctuations, and where is it just a crutch because we haven't done our homework properly? And then how do we train our frontline supervisors to really be good leaders and, uh, and not just be a, a person that churns people out? And we'll see that in big plants. We'll look at one supervisor versus another. This guy's person has 3% turnover. This one has 15 or 16% turnover. What's the difference there? I talked about Memphis. We had three operations in Memphis. One of those operations is a pretty sizable operation, has 1.5% to 2% turnover per month. The other one, uh, right down the road, has got 20% per month. And, there's, and the environment is really pretty much the same. I mean, they're warehouses. Um, you know, one isn't, you know, white floors and, you know, crystal chandeliers. It, it's a warehouse, right? But the way that they're managed and the way that the leader manages his people and the way that they manage their people is completely, not completely different, but markedly different, the, the type of leadership that's displayed. And so we are focused, uh, I think, really laser focused on how do we change those leadership behaviors and get better leaders in the plant train those better leaders about what they need to do to, to manage uh, this activity better. Okay. Thank you. Well, we're going to have to end the discussion now. Uh, we're finishing a little bit early because we've, we've got some meetings and things that, that you know, we have to, some of the panel members have to go to. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Firstly, you know, who needs a strong workforce pipeline anyway because everything's going to be automated. It's going to be robots <laughs> and autonomous trucks. So who cares? Now, obviously, that's a flippant comment, just in case people don't know me. Um, but I'd like to thank the panel for firstly raising uh, this topic as a topic, because uh, I said it was the panel, and Wendy in particular, who wanted to focus on it. So thank you very much for raising the topic, and thank you very much for an interesting and honest discussion. Thank you very much to the panel. <laughs>